This episode of First Contact features discussions of death, grief, suicide, funerals and certain religious practices. So if you don't feel up to listening to anything like that, maybe skip this one. Thank you. You're listening to a podcast from thespoilist.com. Welcome to First Contact. Insert your own pithy comment here. I'm Andrew. I'm James. And I'm Alex. This time we have been watching Half a Life. It first aired the week of May 6, 1991. The story was by Ted Roberts and Peter Allen Fields. The teleplay was by Peter Allen Fields and it was directed by Les Landau. James, what happens in this one? Half-Life is a series of first-person shooter games developed and published <laughs> by Valve. No, no, we're not, we're not doing that. In fact, we're not, we're not doing a video games podcast. What, what do you think we are? We're not cool like Andy Crane and Violet Berlin. We can't pull that off. It'd be better though, wouldn't it? it, it that would be great. I, I would listen to that. <laughs> I, I played through all of the games for this podcast. You, you told me we're doing, <laughs> we're doing the Half Life podcast. No, we're doing Half a Life. I wanted you to watch a drama about two old people. Oh, okay, okay. The Enterprise is participating in a scientific mission to help the people of Kalon 2 restore life to their failing star. Leading the project is Dr. Timerson who has dedicated his life to this research, but is out of his element on the Enterprise, having come from an isolationist world. Loaxana Troy is also on board visiting her daughter, but takes an interest in Timerson, which is eventually reciprocated. After the experiment fails, he reveals to her that he is returning to his planet to take part in The Resolution a ritual suicide all members of his society participate in when they turn 60. Enjoying his newfound companionship, and with the desire to continue his work, Timerson requests asylum on the Enterprise, which risks causing a diplomatic incident. With his faith lost, and at the pleading of his family, he eventually returns to the planet to honour the traditions which isn't exactly the neat bow of an ending you expect on Star Trek. Good. Well, Alex, you'd never seen this episode before. What did you think of it? Well, I mean, I only have a limited amount of uh, time to myself in the evening by the time that you've dealt with a small, screaming, nearly three-year-old, put him to bed after making him dinner, showered and had dinner yourself, sat down. So it's always nice to watch something cheery. (laughs) And in... (laughs) It works out really well here. There's nothing I enjoy more than uh, ritualistic suicide. Um, I mean, it's 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 good. Um, it, it it's it's a worthy episode, and that and that, that can sometimes be a bad thing in Star Trek. But obviously, here it, it's it's exploring something, uh, and and at least doing a reasonably good job of it, which is. Well, it makes it a lot more interesting and engaging to watch. I wasn't checking my phone. That can only be a good thing. I'm not entirely sure how I feel about some of the conclusions it reaches, uh, but equally some of the conclusions I thought it would reach weren't reached, which is good. Uh, I'll, I'll see how I feel by the end of this podcast, but I mean... Frankly, anyone that generally thinks that we're far too politically correct over the course of this and the next episode are, are really in for a hard slog. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was really hoping that that you would just explain explicitly what you felt about the episode because I I have no idea what to think. I I, I tweeted both of you yesterday, basically saying I'm not sure about my thoughts because I. I'm watching it and I'm thinking, I, I really enjoyed it, but am I missing something which means it's sending out the wrong message? I kind of get the feeling that it's trying to say the right thing. It's trying to counter the idea that all Star Trek does is be the the moral gods of the galaxy. I, I'm certainly glad that I went into it without any prior knowledge, because I... 
I think it works best in that scenario. The the way that it purposefully wrong foots you from the off of Here, here's Luxana. Oh, it's gonna be a comedy episode. <laughs> I'm going to die. Yeah, you know, from what from what you would consider is probably going to be a sort of light knockabout sex romp, as seems to always be the case. To go in from that into John Logan's run, it's it, it's quite the tone shift. Um, it, it's it's good, you know. I I will always praise the unexpected. That's a lie. I won't always praise <laughs> the unexpected, but at least it was done well here. Um, it is. The whole Logan's Run aspect of the episode actually important is that is that what the episode is about? Because I I don't actually think it is. I think that the the ritual, the the resolution, that's just a means to an end to show how one society is different to another. Uh I I I think because of the way they address it and the particular topic that they've chosen that they are. It's it's not necessarily the only driving force, but it is intrinsically linked. That you you have dual concepts of uh, the idea of uh, the aging population, and at what point do they get seen as irrelevant in society? Uh, and that's battling up against um, the concept of, I mean, white saviorism, I suppose. If we're if we're going to really start down that line that early, um, so I, I, I don't think you can say that one is the driving theme. I think they are, they are both driving features of the episode. But I think they could have made more of it if they wanted to. You know, you could have made it more of a moral quandary. You know, that this is a planet that has a dying sun. You would assume that the planet is dying in some way as well that resources are scarce and maybe the, the planet did come to this point where the resolution was a necessity rather than something that you know just happened naturally over time I mean I, I think that element is there and I, they, they certainly talk about the facts of, of how the, the dying planet plays into it I think it, it's a constraint of the runtime um that you, you you can't go into everything in as much depth as you would want. But equally, this is not an episode that you want a two-parter of. <laughs> I, I, I think you're absolutely spot on. Th- this episode, I think, is the only one so far that has begun with uh, Troy's personal log. And all it is is a terse, my mother is on board. I sighed so hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then, then you've got the cards, like, Getting out of the table lift, looking around. It's it's pure comedy. Yeah, I mean, it is absolutely setting up this knockabout comedy episode. And then you have this other science plot, and you think, okay, this is going to be the big B plot. They're going, they're going to save the sun, they're going to do experiments, something's going to go wrong, and that's probably going to take up the 45-minute runtime. But no, it, it's really, it's not that episode at all. It's not the episode that sets up in terms of, you know, the personal drama and it's not the episode that sets up in terms of the the science fiction plot element. That is kind of binned quite early. It's, it's interesting you saying, oh, I don't think this is what the episode's about. But, like, every single element is almost, like, not explored as fully as it might be, but they all contribute almost to... The, the theme of the episode, you know, the dying son about, you know, not being able to continue your life's work. It's, it all kind of ties into that idea of this this light going out. And I think that's to be thoroughly commended as well, because Christ knows there have been a lot of episodes up to this point where the A and the B plot, and Christ, sometimes when it gets down to C, um, just don't link in well enough together. I, admittedly, not so much this season, and, and we're a long way away from, uh, I don't know, Picard and Riker are dealing with some alien threat that's going to take over everyone's minds while Geordie and Data are building a model ship in a bottle. Um, it's it, We haven't been at that point for some time, but I, I think when it does manage to tie everything together so neatly, you've got to commend it. And 
in another way, this is a completely irregular episode. It's it's almost another format breaker. We had first contact earlier in the season, which was let's do an episode from the point of view of an alien civilization, and this one is two guest stars, one recurring, fair enough, but they are the leads in this episode, and the Enterprise crew kind of circle that. They don't really have anything significant to do in terms of the actual drama. And I think that that's quite an interesting detour as well. I'm not sure a lot of shows could really pull that off. I think in some respects that's necessary because the way that they are trying to examine whose opinion on this issue is right, um, I, I, I think because of the way that you your, your feelings are towards the core cast that you see week on week, uh, I, I think you need that outside person where you doubt them a bit more. Uh, it's not to say you couldn't, say, do it with one of the regulars, but I think it works better to not do that. Well, it's it's the prime directive, isn't it? Loaxana doesn't have to follow the prime directive, whereas all the main cast do. Yeah. I still, I still have no idea what the prime directive actually means, because... The Prime Directive applies to pre-warp civilizations, but the Kalons are, are a warp-capable civilization, I would assume. I, I guess you just don't interfere where interference isn't wanted and you have to respect the the society's own traditions, religions and laws, and just because they don't conform to yours doesn't mean you can make a moral judgment on it. Well, do we, do, do we want to get into the uh, the moral maze yet, or do we want to hold fire? <laughs> okay, Michael, set it up for us. <laughs> because uh, it it isn't as it it is and it isn't as clear cut clearly, uh, and I and I think you can try and lay certain real world parallels over the top to to see why that would be the case if we were say talking about a religion in a culture and we were talking about someone's dress that you might see as oppressive uh but that wouldn't be seen by those people to be that case then that is that is one thing but when you're then say talking about uh should we get particularly heavy? I don't think we can really avoid it. When we, if we were say talking about female genital mutilation, then it's a bit more difficult to say. Well, that's their culture. You know, it, it, it's not a sentence I expected on this podcast. I'll be honest. But you, you get what I mean. Yeah. There, there, there are, there are differences, but that doesn't mean that the element of tact analysis doesn't apply to both. Um, and I, I think with the subject matter they've chosen here, we're sort of treading the line between the two. The the Prime Directive doesn't really allow for subtlety. It doesn't allow for interpretation. And I think that's because it's it's meant to be one rule for all situations. And maybe that's a good thing. I, I think as well, one thing that they've done here to, to make it uh, an even more extreme moral quandary is that they, they could have gone further down that Logan's Run route and had that the, the people reaching the age are killed, as in killed by another person, by inverting that and having these people kill themselves and it be their choice... That adds a whole other element of complexity. It is interesting because it doesn't seem to be a sad thing. And I I don't think Star Trek is in any way making the case that we should take out all 60-year-olds, which, you know, to me, it it does does sound... It does sound young, you know, that that doesn't... We don't think of that as old. I don't know if that was... Thought you were going to say that sounds like a good idea. (laughs) I, I, I... I think that's probably us all showing <laughs> the the fact that certainly certainly you and I are now closer 
to 60. Sorry, we're not close to 60, but we are moving towards 60 faster than we were moving towards 30. Certainly. The, the 30 is, is, is behind me now. Like, that that's gone. That's, that's, that's long, gone. Forget about gone. it. I, but the the, uh, the the fact that they welcome it. But the, you know, there, there is a slightly compelling argument in that. I and mean, you know, I, I ha- having lived lived with someone with a degenerative condition. This the idea that you know you get to go out on your own terms and you are completely yourself and you don't have to give in to the the frailties or the infirmities of old age you know there 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 is there is something in that and i'm not saying oh i agree that this is a thing that we can do but there there is a certain dignity i think in that argument not that you can't make a contribution after that point not that obviously lots of people don't contribute to life into their 90s but you know you you can understand like from the 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 fact that they said our society was completely unbalanced like i think it's more than a lot of star trek societies that's a pretty plausible idea yeah but this is why i don't actually think the episode is making a message on assisted suicide because it's a fixed age it's just regardless of regardless of your health or your your abilities at that age it's 60 and you're gone uh, agreed i don't think it's specifically on the issue of assisted suicide but i do think it's sort of uh on the issue of a culture that has something in it so like i said you could give a million different examples but say religious dress uh facial scarring you know just plucking different examples of things that are considered controversial between different societies you know arranged marriage arranged marriages yeah absolutely it's it, it, it's it's less a, a comment on one particular type of thing rather than the issue of one culture looking at another and saying well that's barbaric which which doesn't necessarily mean that it, it isn't a horrible practice but it is someone else's. <laughs> well, I think, you know, it's like there are some cultures in the world who will look to the way people in, in Britain or, or America have funerals. It's a very somber, sad occasion over here. But there, there are many cultures in the world who use it as a time to celebrate the life of the person who's passed away. So they would look at us and think that, that we're quite horrible, really. Hey, even even between the UK and the US, it's much more common in the US than it is in the for, for our international listeners. It's far more common in the US than it is in the UK for an open casket funeral, and I think to many of us in this country, that is considered one of the most hideously awful things you can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I I, I realise that. That is partially me bringing my own bias to the issue. You know, there's been situations in my life before where I've been asked, "Would you like to see the, this person they've, that's just died in the hospital?" And I've, my reaction has been, "Absolutely, Christ, no! I don't want my last memory to be of the corpse of that person rather than the person." But, but yeah, the idea of an open coffin funeral is just, is it just seems weird to to me but that's me and i would be different were i in another country i think that's the point that the episode wants to make and it just uses an exaggerated example which it has to do because if it didn't you you wouldn't care (laughs) (laughs) but it it play the the exaggerated example it plays very well into the the theme of the episode and i guess it, it is a loxana episode and you know it's about someone growing old and being afraid of being alone and wondering is there a future is is there still meaning to be found in relationships and i mean we've sort of had these comedy episodes where it's like oh she's searching for a husband and mostly people laugh at her or advances are rebuffed but it does seem a very real thing here and in in this space of 45 minutes for an episode and i think we get that in the next one as, as well when you're having to play oh they're in love and you have to set that up in 10 minutes or, 
or something like that. It maybe doesn't quite reach the depth that you want it to, but I think here you have two very good actors and playing characters, which I think suit them well. You know, David Ogden Steers does a sort of uh, wistful melancholy incredibly well, and you, 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 you can buy into that relationship, I think, in that short space of time. He's he's absolutely wonderful. I, I I loved him on Mash as Major Winchester. He was my favorite character, and he's he nails it here as well. I was slightly distracted by the fact that when I was first watching it, that I had a two year old running around, and so I couldn't necessarily hear the names, but I could read them on the screen. And uh, at a distance, it it did rather look like his name was Tim Minchin. <laughs> uh, I just thought Tim Minchin's had a hard time in lockdown, hasn't he? I mean, he does. He does look in this like every bloke in a biker bar I've ever seen. I once went to a comedy festival in Neath in Wales to see Charlie Chuck, which was fairly obscure, and it was one of those situations where you walk in and the pub went silent because we weren't local, and just the bloke behind the bar going, "You're not from round here, are you, lads?" And that's what everyone in that pub looked like. But no, going back a second, yeah, they. They are both very good in this. And they do what we were saying before about setting up the episode as if it will be a comedy episode and then switching it. They switch it quite quickly as well. They could have played on it for longer. I'm glad that they didn't. You know, it's, it switches very quickly once you get into the turbo lift with that whole, um, uh, oh, are you single? No, my... Oh, no, 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 my wife is quite dead. She's she's definitely dead. Um, and at that point, it's like, oh, okay. It's not not quite what we thought it was going to be. No, but that that's still kind of played for comedy because it's like, oh, my, my wife's dead, and then Luaxana, you know, that's her opportunity. Suddenly she's delighted that his wife is dead. Well, it, it, it yes, I know what you mean, but equally the way that she's playing it, I that's what my expectation would be, but the way she's playing it signals, oh, okay, we're not going for that episode this time and, and there's there, there's so much range in that because she is playing you know she does play the the comedy exaggerated version and then you've got the the reflective stuff with her i think her conversation with uh with troy diana troy in this episode that's that's really nice that's a really it's, it's a beautifully shot scene as well and just you know the, the way they use the background and foreground uh, i i think that's really effective and it's actually saying something and it's a mother-daughter conversation which is is welcome in anything and it it is using troy skills as a counselor just to sort of you know discuss something meaningful what what does it mean to to be an older woman what does it mean for her to be influencing someone and the the idea of them almost convincing them to to lose their faith i mean there, there's that element they play and then she plays the righteous anger which we don't really get on star trek next generation really and that's probably another reason why you couldn't use a regular she she is just insanely angry at the world and and again if we're, if we're talking about this on another level you know like okay this isn't this isn't about the ritualistic suicide it's about someone you love dying and there's nothing you can do about it that absolutely plays on that as well so like I think you know, as as a kid, I would probably single this out as a, maybe a boring one. But I think the older you get, probably the more layers you can see in this, and there's there's just a, a lot to be explored in obviously mortality because that's what Star Trek is. But but you can you can see the parallels they are drawing with life, and it's almost like you you get to play that entire kind of grief as well with someone who is there, and you just don't understand why it has to be that way i think you're absolutely right that you 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 need to have experienced well you you no, you don't need to have but it it changes the episode quite drastically when you have reached that moment in your life when you consider am i am i off the the roll call of general cultural significance to society at this point Pro- probably either towards the end of your 20s or in your early 30s and you you get that sense of hmm. The the certain chances that I might have had to do something that would change the world have passed me by, and 
my <laughs> my outlook has changed somewhat from this point. Well, uh, and and that plays in. Obviously, it has been my life's work. All this science I've done, I have I've put everything in to trying to fix my planet, to do this experiment, to try and save a star, and all my life's work has been a waste of time. And y- you know. And and I, I I say this like as as not not to put this down, but in in my life in terms of creating things, I did have more ambition than a Star Trek: The Next Generation podcast. But I have become very aware over the last eight years or whatever it is that this actually is a huge body of work that I have made, and it's and it is like oh. The thing that I really planned on doing, or the thing that was just filling time, is actually the the thing that is possibly the most notable contribution out with work, which, let's be frank, doesn't really matter. And you know, so so the creative endeavor that I have done is is a hundred episodes of a podcast, and you you do start to question your life choices at that point. But again, I really. And at a certain point in your life, someone questioning if their life's work has been worth it is is good, and you're tuning in to, to my midlife crisis here. Look at it this way. When you turn 60 and you're about to commit ritualistic suicide, you'll think, at least I made first contact. At least we've got to the end of season six. <laughs> <laughs> and hey, if we don't finish it, someone else will continue our work. The work started before us, and it will continue after us. <laughs> I really don't think that's true. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just, I'll just put my son in. Is, is that is that just that a clause in your wills? <laughs> Boy, this is what we born, you were born for. <laughs> Sit around and needlessly nitpick the nitpicker's guide. Our forefathers left incomplete podcasts for us to finish, and so shall we for the next generation. There is that that thing. I, I mean, maybe I've I've got the element of uh, I was I was at our support bubble the other day at my mother's and going through the the roof trying to find something and finding all my old school books and sort of looking back at my my things that I was going through. It's, you know, the general generally horrific things that you find, like a poster paint poster that I'd made that just had the phrase "Don't lick your fingers." Uh, <laughs> I, no context as to what that was about. Uh, and the element of looking through and going, oh, should I keep this? Should I throw it? And then thinking, well, what would I do if this was a relative of mine? And, go, and I just thought, I'd bin it. And that that thought of, hmm, all of this body of work, <laughs> and in years of time, it's going to be, oh, this this legacy to leave my child. And they'll review and Well, I can I can listen back to the voice of my father. Is he going to? Is he bollocks? You could speak to him now through this podcast. He could be listening. Son, just do something with your life. <laughs> at this point, at this point, to have listened, presumably from the start to this many episodes, let me maybe this is going out to our listeners at a at a broader rate. The last time I checked before my previous computer died, to listen to all of our podcasts would take you a continuous play about three days, I think. And we've done more since then. We've done at least. <laughs> Five episodes. <laughs> Listen to those early garbage podcasts where we're we're all on shitty mics. That's that's the that's the real doing that's the real gold. Yeah. Doing weird voices. Doing local radio voices. Yeah. Hey, I, I still do a local radio voice. I've just developed it since then. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> That's your Alan Partridge impression, isn't it? That's just my voice. No, be honest. Um, this has gone on a tangent. It has. Uh, so I, I think, I think the thing I, I want to talk about is, is the finale. Because I imagine you could do this show in, in kind of any Star Trek, but the comparison at this point, I guess, is the original series, which I guess the ending would be. They show the people the error of their ways. Kirk uh, kisses a beautiful woman who is not 60. It'd probably be 30 in that series, let's be honest. And uh, society changes and they all embrace uh, 
the American way, basically. And they, they, they see that they're wrong and people can do things, but n- not here. This is um, this is a different ending. Yeah, I, I, I think I expected typical TNG ending, and it, it's it's a really bleak affair. Um, I'm kind of glad it was, but I. <laughs> I just I find it so hard to know how to feel about it because I I'm 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 complete the 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 wet liberal sides of myself are just completely torn. Uh, I'm I'm glad that the white colonialists have not interfered with uh, with these people's culture. Yet I'm equally torn about the fact that they are doing something needlessly harmful to themselves. It, it I. The episode has got me where it wants it. <laughs> you bastards. And it, it's important to note that they are willing to respect Timerson's wishes either way. They Picard wanted to emphasise that he hadn't been coerced into changing his mind in either direction. They were willing to go to war over this in order to allow Timerson asylum on board. But he came to his own conclusions after his daughter came on board to convince him. And again, going back to what we were saying earlier, I think that's where that element, and it's it's a very clever element in the plotting, of making it the people's choice. I mean, it may be a cultural expectation, but it's not, say, people being killed by a firing squad. It is them taking their own lives. And it, it it does change that somewhat and it does make it a, a, an e- what is already a, a, a grey area a, an even greyer area and when we're talking about octogenarian romance that's a very grey area uh, and isn't it interesting though that there's no element of faith involved that there's no we're going mm. on to a, another place we are going on to heaven we are moving to paradise there's none of that it is just saying you you should be buried in the ground where your wife is and where the rest of your family are and this is what your family expects of you and i guess that is that is very star trek there's there is no promise of something better because you do that you do this because it is the right thing to do essentially yeah i I, i'm i'm particularly glad that faith elements were not tied up with it uh because that it I don't. I don't think it makes a difference to us. No. But it would make a difference to other viewers, and I. Th- I think more so stateside than in the UK. I, I'm. I'm in no way saying that the UK doesn't have a particularly strong religious current, but it. It really not in the same regard. We are far as a country far more culturally Christian than America is Christian. And if religion had been an element of this, it would have me questioning the morals in the writing. We don't actually know if it's rooted in a religion or not. They they're not explicit on that, but it doesn't really. Which is which? No, it, it it's fine. They don't, they don't need to state, and you can read into it how you want. But the fact that they don't they don't outright state there's nothing there's nothing to suggest one way or the other. Um, that that that's a good thing. I think we're we're supposed to assume that it's all linked to the fact that they're they're on a dying planet. There there is that hint that maybe there aren't resources, but again, I think it is. You know, I I, I didn't really know if I liked this episode or not when I watched it because I do I do think it's 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 just a hard one to know about. But this discussion has really sort of there's a lot to it and it's very good it's clearly a very very good screenplay and uh, the the more we talk about it the more things i notice and uh, you know i can't can't say better than that and you know for for anyone who was expecting our our usual conversations you've probably got something a little different from that because it does hit a lot of nerves i think which is it's not always a sign of good writing, but I think here it is very sensitively constructed. At this point, Star Trek is becoming very self-aware. And I think it's it's able to tell better stories as a result of that. 
It understands how to get under the skin of the audience. It does. It does make it difficult to take the piss out of it, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> which, which, when you've got an episode with, with, <laughs> with two sixty-year-olds ha- having a shag before dying, uh, you know, it's it should be fertile ground. Well, I, I mean, for jokes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure we can mine something for quickfire. Quickfire. Michelle Forbes, who makes a brief appearance as Dara, Timison's daughter in this episode, uh, would be noticed by the producers and they would write a part for her, a recurring role. Uh, she would become Ensign Roe in the following seasons of TNG. <laughs> I did like that there was a scene in the transporter room and Loxana takes Timerson away and then we see Picard say, computer, locate Councillor Troy, and it hard cuts before we hear the computer reply. And it got me wondering, have we ever heard Loxana Troy and the computer speak in the same scene? <laughs> That's very good. A little character detail and a and a little kind of thing that is also seems a bit self aware. I really enjoyed uh, Chief O'Brien locking the transporter before leaving a room. <laughs> that was very good. It's like I, it's, usually nothing's ever locked on the Enterprise, but this, yeah, that that was that was fun. A nice little detail, I think, for fans. I think unusually TNG does deal with aging rather interestingly i think we've had sarah already which is about losing your control and your composure through illness and and then you have this about being useful and and facing your own mortality and then i think you've got relics as well which is perhaps a bit lighter but it's good that the show has a point of view that isn't purely based on on young people or even just as regular characters, it does actually take a look at different perspectives. And I think those three episodes are interesting. And I'm not sure if, if TV does a lot of that these days. And and then, of course, you've got Star Trek Picard, which, which is completely about aging and then becoming a robot. Considering it's a, a, a deep and quite depressing episode, uh, I was expecting something completely inappropriate from Phil Farrand in The Nitpicker's Guide. Uh, amazingly, he has restrained himself. Uh, I'm, I'm taken aback. So I, I'm, I'm purely reduced to nitpicking the nitpicker. So this, this will be fairly bloody-minded, but uh, let's go for it anyway. Uh, changed change premises um at one point during menage's troy Riker and troy look for a quiet romantic spot to relax on beta z of course loxana comes bustling in interrupting them she spreads out a picnic and Riker and troy sit down loxana then offers Riker an oscoid leaf he acts like he's never had one before Riker offers it to troy as if she's never had one before Yet in half a life, Loxana orders Oscoid from the food replicator. When Tim Minchin asks what it is, and yes, I am sticking with Tim Minchin, uh, Loxana says it's a Beta Z delicacy. If Oscoid leaves are a Beta Z delicacy, why do Riker and Troy act like they'd never eaten them before in Menagerie Troy? Troy grew up on Beta Z, and Riker was stationed there for several years. Right. Who's had pheasant? Uh, no, I can I can say I've never eaten pheasant. I've not. I've not. Had I have never eaten no. pheasant. No, I I have spent I have spent time stationed, if you can call holidays, in France. Have I had frogs legs? Have I had escargot? No, I have not. What a load of bollocks! <laughs> Fair. Well, thank you for listening. Uh, we will be back next time talking about the host we hope you will join us for that one goodbye 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 (laughs) 
Star Trek Picard is the first Star Trek to give prominent screen time to one dog's bollocks. Which is ironic, really. <laughs> 